it's going to be pretty important for Miriam to have a play in this matchup, you got to figure. You want to get online really early with your Phoenixes. The Amulet Titan deck, if you don't kill them, they kind of just have inevitability. Their deck is just so redundant. Yeah, uh, the the problem with uh, Amulet Titan for, for the Is That Phoenix deck is that the Is That Phoenix deck really thrives when either you or your opponent are interacting in a meaningful way. Uh, is That Phoenix being able to utilize their gut shots to take care of one toughness creatures, their lightning bolts to take care of other cheap creatures, um, or if the opponent uh, has a bunch of their own spot removal that doesn't really deal with Arclight Phoenix. These are all situations that Is That Phoenix wants to be in. Unfortunately for Ross, this Amulet Titan deck not really looking to play fair, and any point of interaction that Ross has needs to be able to take care of these mana creatures in a hurry, or they're going to take over the game by themselves. Miriam started with Spire Bluff Canal, Harvey just with the Gemstone Mine, and step Miriam with the Thought Scour, just a couple spells. He'll start a second turn with Mana Morphos into Blue Red, into Opt, into Faithless Looting, does get one Arc Light Phoenix for his trouble on the second turn. That'll knock Harvey down to 17. Yeah, and if he can uh, leverage that uh, early chip damage with Arclight Phoenix into uh, a big burst over the next turn or two, uh, he could potentially steal this game. Harvey, with no one-drop point of uh, acceleration, no Amulet of Vigor, and no uh, Sakura Tribe Scout, there's a chance that his draw might be too slow this game. Second turn for Harvey, Simic Growth Chamber picking up that gemstone mine. He was on the draw. That'll mean he'll discard Primeval Titan to hand size here. Yeah, while the Is That Phoenix deck doesn't have any real meaningful interaction in this matchup in game one, uh, things like Lightning Bolt and Gutshot do accumulate damage to the dome. If Ross is able to find that uh, uh, crux of the game to, to leverage those burn spells into a win, that could be a, a route to victory for him for sure. Nothing pre-combat for Miriam this time. Usually, if you had access to the second Phoenix, you would have already seen it. So he's just going to start with an attack for three. That'll knock Harvey to 14. Yeah, to me that signifies something like Thing in the Ice is coming this turn with, with uh, Faithless Looting in the graveyard as well as just a, a bunch of cards in hand that all do relatively the same type of stuff. You know, Seer Vision, Sleight of Hand, things of that nature. It's, a, it's important if you're playing the Phoenix deck to know when you should be playing on your main phase because, of course, the Arclight Phoenix triggers at the beginning of your combat step after your first main phase. Spire Bluff Canal, third land for Miriam, and no follow-up. I saw at least a Flame Slash in the hand, which is pretty awkward here. Though he does have, I believe, five cards. No action, though. Yeah, the Flame Slash not looking too good in this particular spot, um, but uh, we'll, we'll see how his draw turns out here. Cavern of Souls, second land for Harvey. He'll play a Sousa Lost, but seeking. Here comes Ghost Quarter and Gemstone Mine. Yeah, it looks like Harvey actually has a Through the Breach in his hand. Uh, with the Gym Summon, he does have access to red mana. Uh, and Ross only has, uh, like, one Is That Charm in the main deck that can affect that. So if he can't find that Is That Charm, there's a chance Dominic Harvey Through the Breach his next turn and puts in something giant, like a Primeval Titan with Haste or an Emrakul the Aeon's Torn. Speaking of giants, that was the name for Cavern of Souls. The Asusa was technically counterable, but that wasn't going to happen. No end step action for Miriam, so he wasn't waiting on something like a Thought Scour, just kind of not using his mana over the course of that turn. Yeah, I'm not really sure what he has going on in hand. Um, I, I would have loved to have seen a flashback that uh, Faithless Looting, but it looks like he actually does have that Is That Charm in hand that one of could save his life here on the following turn. Here's another attack for three that'll knock Harvey to 11. Is it Charm to do two damage to the Asusa is the play post combat? With Flame Slash in hand, I am not a huge fan of that play. That is a charm has some value, but Ross might not know about how this Amulet Titan deck uh, has these through the breaches to, to interact. You know, uh, he might just you know not know about all the things that Dominic could be doing, and it looks like he's about to get hit with an Emrakul <laughs> and lose everything. Yikes! There's crumbling <laughs> vestige for that red mana and it, through face the breach. Emrakul, give me a face shot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's just hes muttering to himself like, what in the heck is happening? How did I not play around this? What did I do? Add this one to the Ross Miriam highlight reel, or should I say the low light reel. It'll <laughs> sacrifice all five of his permanents. Oh, Take a hit for 15. Mad at me for laughing so much. <laughs> Harvey will sacrifice the number cool. Shuffle that in the graveyard back in. Back to Miriam. He does have a land. There's Island. Here's Serum Visions. 
is going to try to rebuild here, but uh, I'm pretty sure Dominic Harvey actually has access to a Primeval Titan in hand and two green mana. He's going to be able to cast that next turn and probably put this one out of reach. A uh, single Bajuka Bog is going to exile the whole graveyard, including that Phoenix. Uh, something like Kabir Crossroads or uh, the colorless one, Radiant Fountain, uh, is going to gain him some life, and that's going to be all she wrote. Yeah, Steering Vision scried one top, one bottom. The, the play for Harvey is Primeval Titan, and uh, Ross is going to pack him up. Yeah, and honestly, the, I can't blame Ross for using that as a charm like he did. The dealing a, a two damage to the uh, the Zusa in that spot, uh, you know, doesn't there aren't a lot of targets for Izzet Charm in the normal versions of these uh, Amulet Titan decks, but they're just getting crazily punished by through the Breach Emmer Cool. Yeah, that was pretty wild. I, I like this build for Dominic Harvey this weekend. For Ross Miriam, his sideboard here, he's going to have two Abrades, a Ceremonious Rejection, two Stony Silence, a Snapcaster Mage, two Surgical Extraction, a Dispel, two Spell Pierce, two Path to Exile, an Injured Explosives, and the big one, Blood Moon. Is there anything else you like, though? Uh, I mean, so the Blood Moon is obviously coming in. Something like Explosives can help deal with uh, Emulant of Vigor. Um, Path to Exile could be a, an out to something like a Resolve Primeval Titan. I don't know. It's it's tough. Like you, the whole reason that I don't like playing this is that Phoenix deck is because you're in such a tough spot against things like Amulet Titan, Ironworks. Uh, you don't really have a significant clock usually, or at least not a good enough clock. But also your your points of interaction are usually based on whether or not your opponent has a lot of creatures to target. And uh, unfortunately for him, he's he's going to basically need a hail mary here to come back, especially after that game one destruction that was the through the breach Emrakul. Yeah, it's really awkward. You don't really know without the deck list how many Through the Breaches Harvey is on. You can't likely beat it if it resolves. So there's some tension with the Dispel. It's otherwise bad against the deck. Well, I think Dispel is actually okay against the deck. Summoner's Pact is an instant, and the deck does function a lot via Summoner's Pact, uh, whether that's uh, drawing it naturally or transmuting for it via Telario West. So Dispel does have some play in normal versions, and so he does actually get a little bit added value thanks to the Through the Breaches here. Uh, what I'm, I'm most... Uh, uh, excited to see is, is whether or not he brings in Spell Pierce, just because he needs something. And uh, I, I don't know if that something is going to end up being a Braid or Spell Pierce, um, but you know it might be both, and it could be neither. Yeah, you got to balance your ability to proactively do your thing while also disrupting your opponent. Right. For Dominic Harvey, with his unique build of Amulet Titan, the sideboard here, he has an Abrade, a Walking Ballista, two Rending Volleys, that, that might have something to do with this matchup, actually, a Corsair Crufix, a Rurik Thar the Unbowed, a World Spied Worm, a Hornet Queen, two Spell Pierce of his own, two Relic of Regenitus, two Fire Spout, and a Gate. There's actually a lot to like in this sideboard. Yeah, so I think one of the key threats from Ross Miriam is going to be Thing in the Ice. Uh, you see an uptick of Rending Volley out of people's sideboards lately, and I think Thing in the Ice has a little bit to do with that. Uh, I think those are definitely going to come in. Um, something like Corsair Kruvix can gain you some much needed points of life over the course of the game. Um, you know, with those bounce lands like Simic Growth Chamber, uh, as well as things like Azusa, sometimes you get to play two, three, or more lands all in the same turn, especially if you're casting a Primeval Titan, and it helps really put that away. And if Ross is going to be trying to, you know, kind of chip damage you one for one you with things like a Braid, Spell Pierce, whatever, having a, a natural source of card advantage via Corsair Kruvix is definitely wanted. Rorkthar shuts the door on Ross completely, 100% bringing that in. Hornet Queen can protect uh, for a turn or two against some of the more annoying threats from Ross outside of Thing in the Ice. Um, Spell Pierce is okay. This FX deck usually works on one or two mana, but there aren't a lot of really important instants and sorceries uh, to hit with the Spell Pierce, so I can see him leaving that out. I do think Relic of Progenitus comes in, though I don't think it's all that effective. Sure. Yeah, it's a card you can find with your Ancient Stirrings. It does cost two mana when you actually want to fight over the graveyard, just because the only cards Miriam cares about has Having in the graveyard, Arclight Phoenix, Faithless Looting, and Relic does let Ross choose what he exiles. Yeah, I think important to note that Crackling Drake does not care about these graveyard removal spells like Relic of Progenitus, uh, Rest in Peace. They do not affect uh, his Crackling Drake at all. It's one of the reasons why Crackling Drake's in the deck to begin with. Relic of Progenitus does have that upside of being able to take care of the Phoenixes, which are one of the uh, early threats that Ross can assemble, but uh, I don't know how effective they are in this particular matchup. 
Yeah, crackling Drake kind of technology that Ross Miriam introduced to the modern format when he took down a modern open with this Is It Phoenix deck. And she said the Baltimore open it was. Dominic Carvey playing a pretty unique build here. For you modern players at home, we do have a nice modern tournament coming up March 9th. We have SCG Regionals, the Season 1 Regionals this year, modern format. These are going to be in 12 locations across the country. Go find the location near you. Here's a list of them here. You can find more information at go.starcitygames.com slash regionals. Find out where you're going to play. I usually make it out to regionals in the Minneapolis area myself. Yeah, I usually go to Raleigh-Durham. i uh, got a couple of friends out there. usually have a free place to stay. It's a good weekend of it. Uh, a lot of uh, really great, fun magic, sweet prizes, and uh, this year is going to be no different, especially with those Star City Games points on the line. If you're trying to qualify for the Players' Champion this year, uh, the Regional Championships is definitely step one, making sure you hit those on uh, the weekends where we don't actually have an Open to attend. The points are very important, and at the top 20 is quite a, quite a lot. Yeah, $1,200 and 20 SEG points, not to mention that the top eight all getting an invitation to the Invitational at SCGCon Summer we have coming up yep. in June. And uh, when you make it out to Regionals, we actually have a really nice, unique token to give you. We have both the 4-4 Angel and, of course, the Andrew Jessup Monarch token. This is just... Hands down, the best uh, Invitational token that we've had made so far. I love it when you call me Big Papa. <laughs> 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 Andrew, Andrew Jessup just looking like a beast. And uh, then we also have the great Godspeed. Uh, this is a, a playmat as well as a token that you can uh, pick up if you join regionals today. Go to go.starcygames.com slash regionals to figure out one near you and get your hands on all this great swag and uh, attend this great tournament series. And the playmat is going to be for the first 200 players to register at each location. Make sure you pre-register and get your hands on the playmat. And also just as somebody who runs a game store, pre-registration makes things run a lot more smoothly for us and for you. Yeah, and also you just make sure that you get that swag, that playmat, those tokens. And honestly, those I don't know how easy it's going to be to, to actually get those uh, uh, Big Papa tokens, Andrew Jessup. Um, I, if, as far as I know, the only way to get them is going to regionals. I'm going to ask everybody at the tournament if they actually want theirs. Do you want to trade? collect as many as I can. Do you want to trade? You know what you can do? You can sell them to your friends for a dollar, five dollars, or ten dollars. I could hoard them. Yeah. Put them in a closet and forget <laughs> about them. And then one day discover my treasure trove of Andy J. Monarch tokens. Well, once Andy J. becomes super famous for being the world's smartest man, <laughs> uh, which he very easily could be, dude's, dude's a br real brain genius. He's in contention. I would not immediately disqualify him from that competition. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, once he's super famous, just get him to sign him, and then you'll be rich too. Or I can get him to sign him, put him back in the closet. <laughs> Wait another 30 years. <laughs> and then people are like, oh, remember that brain genius, Andrew Jessup? Yeah. I knew him. Out. He yeah. signed these. I have no proof that this is his signature. This is your Mickey Mantle <laughs> rookie card or whatever. Jessup, far from a rookie. I get, I get the reference. I get the reference. Yeah, well, the, the veteran Mickey Mantle card is not nearly as expensive as the <laughs> rookie Mickey Mantle cards, which was what I was referencing, a la baseball cards, which... Which are now worthless. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, everything is worthless unless someone's willing to pay for it. And I'm pretty sure you can find someone willing to pay top dollar for a Mickey Mantle rookie card. I might pay top dollar for an Andrew Jessup Monarch token. Well, at this point, top dollar probably... Uh, Probably like ten bucks. Top and dollar. Top top one dollar. Yeah, top one. Uh, Ross Miriam gonna be on the play here. Pluto Delta is gonna be fetching up a hollowed fountain tapped. Dominic Harvey, just a Solaria West tap for his first turn. He did mulligan to six. Yeah, and it looks like his hand is uh, not super explosive. I saw a teetering peaks hanging out in there. Uh, land entering the battlefield tapped on the first turn. You know, he's really gonna need something like Amulet of Vigor next turn to, to get things going. 
One of the cooler additions to his version, though, is actually Coalition Relic. The fifth relic in his deck uh, effectively generates uh, two mana per turn with that charging-esque ability. Um, allows him to cast those Titans a little bit earlier than normal. Second turn for Miriam. Here's Scalding Tarn fetching to 18 for Basic Mountain. Disguising a little bit that he has Blood Moon in his deck. It is just the one copy. Yeah, and it's, it's definitely uh, in his deck. Whether or not it's in his hand is a different story. He'll start with Mana Morphos on the second turn. We'll see if he can produce one or more Phoenixes here again. Well, Mana Morphos is usually the best possible start to getting those Phoenixes out there, usually following that up with uh, Faithless Looting and then, uh, you know, another Instant or Sorcery. One blue, one red. The second Mana Morphos is the cast. He'll now use that blue mana off this one to Thought Scour himself. Island and Thing in the Ice flipped over. Here's Faithless Looting with the red mana. Are there any Phoenixes? Yeah, and that's the question. Well, there's, there's at least one. Second card picked oh, up there two. was Phoenix, and that is his second Phoenix. They're both coming back. Here's a swing for six. Dominic Harvey to 14. Yeah, and you saw Ross there actually uh, playing that as well as possible, digging into his deck as much as he can with things like uh, Mana Morphos before going for that huge Faithless Looting, discarding those two Phoenixes and uh, getting paid off there with that second Phoenix as the last draw. Just a basic forest for turn two on... Dominic Harvey's side, we go back to Miriam, who's going to start things with the Faithless Looting here. And it would be very good for Miriam if he can win this game without showing the Blood Moon. If you can just have that as a trump card in Game 3. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Ross here drew another uh, Arclight Phoenix. Let's see if he has the requisite number of instant sorceries here to deploy it. Crackling Drake and I believe a Braid were discarded. Spire Bluff Canal is the land, so not going to go for any Phoenix shenanigans. Just an attack for six. Harvey down to eight. Yeah, I mean, he has a Bolt in hand, plus he has uh, another Phoenix he can hard cast next turn. There's a chance Ross actually just bolts here in response to the first uh, bounce land. And then uh, attacks for lethal. And those two Arclay Phoenix coming out on turn two and attacking... That's a lot of damage in a hurry. And the Is It Phoenix deck is a deck with some disruption. That's one of the draws. But really, the big draw is a modern deck that sometimes just gets you quick. Yeah, and uh, it plays a lot like uh, the Hollow One deck does, where you can have these starts that are particularly degenerate by deploying multiple Phoenixes on the, the second turn. Um, you know, but it also has this really nice, fair game plan that revolves around Thing in the Ice, killing creatures, and, and such. The, the Arclight Phoenix are, are very strong uh, when you assemble them early on, uh, but uh, they're also a way to play this, like, resiliency plan against an opposing deck with a bunch of spot removal like Fatal Push and Lightning Bolt. Yeah, Ross Miriam, one of the early adopters of the Is It Phoenix deck. Uh, he's, of course, the player who first showed up with Crackling Drake used that uh, to take down a modern open as we mentioned earlier this year though he's been around a lot longer than that. Are you saying he's old? Because I'm older than him and I'll fight you right now. Over the fact that you're old? Uh, oh yeah. I think you would fight me <laughs> anyway if that's, the, that's what we're fighting over. Well 24 open top 8s with 5 wins. That's really close to me stats. It is. Yeah, humble you brags. Have, you have 30 in chain. Not so humble brags. <laughs> uh, I, I've, I've, I don't know. We're going to have to check my slide at some point, but I'm pretty sure I have 32 with six wins. Um, but Nick would know better than me. I stopped counting a long time ago. You know, I'm just – there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> pretty strong stats for the year 2018 for the 30-year-old from Middletown, Connecticut. 19 opens played, five top eights, a little over 25% top eight conversion with one win, 20% of the top eights. Really strong numbers. Ross Miriam, of course, a numbers guy, trivia guy, Jeopardy fan, had one showing in, two, in 2016 you're on the darn, show. You're darn right it was one showing. Got straight pranjolled out of that one. <laughs> but uh, frankly... I could get nowhere near being on Jeopardy, so it's impressive just to get on the show. Oh, absolutely. We, we give Ross crap all the time. Uh, you know, if I don't like you, I'm not going to talk smack about you. Just throwing that out there. Fair. So if I'm talking smack about you, that means I care. It's good to know. Good <laughs> Ryan, to know. you're the worst. That's true. <laughs> Remember a B Team BCW <laughs> is Ross, Miriam. Uh, they are trying to get... Some or all of their players to the Players' Championship this year, though Ross Miriam has been very capable of making that tournament if we've run it in the past. It looks like both players here 
uh, getting ready to draw their opening hands. I'm really curious to see if, if uh, this is that Phoenix deck from Ross Merriam can pull out this game three. He needs that Amulet Titan deck to have another kind of mediocre draw, or he needs to find one of his really powerful sideboard cards, or those few pieces of interaction that are actually meaningful. Yeah, even on the draw, turn three Blood Moon is usually good enough in this matchup. Right, uh, the Blood Moons that, the you know, from Ross's side, go unchecked for the most part from the Amulet Titan deck. They're kind of under the, the impression that if my opponent plays a Blood Moon, I can't really win anyway. Um, you know, the, all the mana producers are lands, and uh, without drawing that basic force, you're in a lot of trouble. So, I mean, you look at the sideboard from uh, Dominic Harvey, and you see basically no way to get rid of it. You have counter spells via Spell Pierce and Negate. Those are ways to check it, but if you're uh, not holding up mana, that's uh, somewhat problematic. It is worth noting that Harvey's configuration with the Through the Breach plan is probably the strongest build against Blood Moon of Amulet Titan that we've ever seen just in the main deck. Absolutely. It also gives it just another uh, really explosive form of attack that some decks might not be prepared against. It also gives it that added speed that it might have lost from losing uh, its... Uh, Summer Blooms uh, a few years ago. It's really reminiscent. There was a time in Modern where things were pretty fast and players played the Scape Shift deck, except it was more just driven on Primeval Titan and it was actually Through the Breach Titan. Yes. Oath and Nissa was a fixture of that deck. And despite the fact that Through the Breach didn't really do what you wanted to do, you know, you kind of need to get up to a land threshold. It was just like a weird element to your deck that works sometimes. And you use Simonian Spirit Guy, which also doesn't produce lands. You just use that element to just go a little bit faster, where this Through the Breach Emrakul, it's a little bit weird in the deck. You can at least stirrings into Emrakul, but you only draw the Through the Breach sometimes. But it's just right. a concession to wanting to go faster sometimes. Yeah, I think that that, that is the, the key talking point here, is that uh, Primeval Titan... Uh, sometimes it's not fast enough, costing six mana. The Through the Breach not only can let it come down a turn faster, you get to attack with it immediately and get that extra burst immediately. And as we've seen time and time again, the, uh, the Titan dying doesn't matter. They can reassemble a Titan on the following turn after getting those four extra land drops. But the added ability of getting to hit your opponent with a cheap Emrakul on uh, as early as turn two, I think, with uh, with the right amulet draw plus Skur Tribe Scout, uh, there's a chance that you could just uh, through the breach on turn two, hit your opponent with uh, uh, a Primeval Titan and, and do a lot of damage. It's like Dominic Harvey has mulligan to six. He'll stop there. Ross Merriam's mulliganing to five here. Not a good sign. If you were paying close attention, you would have seen Ross kind of playfully bantering with Dominic Harvey. Showed him the faithless looting double Arclight Phoenix in his opener. Not keeping that one because he didn't have a land. But here, getting uh, on a mulligan to five, there's a chance he might have should have gambled a little bit and uh, took the risk, seeing as this matchup is not particularly good for him. Yeah, it's on the draw with the scry. The tough thing is, you know, once you discard those Arclight Phoenixes, you still need to cast three spells in a turn. You need to catch a couple lands, but you're right. Sometimes you do just need to try to get lucky. Yeah, I don't think that was the spot, but I have kept my fair share of no landers uh, that with like two or three really good cards on the curve in the particular matchup, and knowing exactly where I'm at in the matchup uh, really helps me determine on how risky of certain keeps I should should keep. Yeah, you know, if uh, you start playing Magic with Standard and then you pick up Modern from there. It's going to feel really weird to keep these no land hands. They don't seem functional from that perspective. But for old hats like us who played Legacy before Modern was a format, we've kept some no land Force of Will hands in our time. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, even in Modern, I pretty regularly uh, with Death Shadow keep no landers with a scry and a street race. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you're a lot of times just going to five is just not really an option. You just don't have the raw resources to play that type of a game. Miriam will stop at five. Harvey starts things off with Teetering Peaks. Spire Bluff Canal is the first land for Miriam, though no turn one action. Second play is a Relic of Regenerative for Harvey and a Gruel Turf picking up that Teetering Peaks back on Miriam's side. Flooded Strand is a second land, but still no action. We'll go back to Harvey. Yeah, from Ross's side, uh, he has a Lightning Bolt that I saw. He would have loved to have had something like Thing in the Ice that turn to start uh, applying some pressure to Dominic. Uh, but Dominic's draw is a bit slow, so it's, it's possible Ross just has the time to find something like a Faithless Looting, discard an art like Phoenix, and put pressure on that way. But that Relic of Progenitus is keeping that uh, avenue of attack in check at the moment. 
Harvey will redeploy that teetering peak. No <gasps> other Moon? action. Miriam it might be Blood Moon. He's fetching. He's fetching that funnest strand now after playing Mountain. Yeah, he didn't crack an end stab. It sure seems like he wants to maintain it for something. It's Basic Island. He's at 19. Blood Moon could be the card he needs to steal this game from Dominic Harvey in this in this not particularly good matchup. Though, the Blood Moon, as we said before, not as powerful in this particular iteration against Dominic Harvey because of those through the breaches. Let's see what happens. There's Blood Moon. Big play, functionally stone raining the Gruel Turf. Yeah, that takes away that full land drop uh, because the bounce lands do produce two mana. They require you to return a land to your hand. Dominic going from three mana to two mana. A little bit short of that through the breach right now. Needs at least three more turns. Harvey's deck does play two basic forests. There is a Vesuva hanging out, in, or uh, an Asusa rather, hanging out in hand. Something like basic forest into Asusa could accelerate towards through the breach. Sounds like the Blood Moon is still on the stack. Don't know if Harvey has some kind of play here. He'll exile Relic of Regenitus. Maybe he does have some kind of answer. Uh, I, I don't believe he does. Um, you know, we're looking at the deck list, and, um, you know, he could have been floating a green to bluff something like Nature's Claim uh, to put Ross to the, you know, just made, put that in the back of his mind, you know. But uh, I don't think he has access to any real way with just green and red mana to take care of that Blood Moon with it on the stack. Harvey's turn is Simic Growth Mountain. We go back to Ross Miriam. He'll start with Mana Morphos. Makes a blue and a red. Immediately into a second Mana Morphos. Another blue and red. And here's Faithless Looting. Can we get some Phoenixes online? I think he has one, but I could be wrong. Oh, I am wrong. That was a Lightning Bolt. It looks like Scalding Tarn. One of the discards. And he did pick up Thing in the Ice, so second basic island, Thing in the Ice is play for turn. Little light on cards in hand. As we go back to Harvey, and he'll uh, play Bajuka Mountain and cast Amulet of Vigor. Hilariously enough, uh, with the change to how Blood Moon works, Amulet of Vigor basically does nothing because all those lands already enter the battlefield untapped. We go back to Miriam. Here's Serum Visions, Thing in the Ice to three counters. He'll draw and scry two cards to the bottom. I think it's important to note that Ross actually held up a blue mana last turn uh, with that Serum Visions uh, able to be cast, which leads me to believe that he actually has a Spell Pierce or a Dispel in hand to check that potential through the Breach over the coming turns. Yeah, that would be the one-two punch to first shut off the deck's primary function, and then you have your secondary plan for their plan B as well. Just kind of cover the whole thing. Miriam is going to tap three, leaving that island on tap again. Here's a flashback of Faithless Suiting, a thing in the ice down to two counters. Yeah, and it looks like he, he drew the uh, the ability to transform this thing in the ice this turn if he wants to with land metamorphos and some other instant or sorcery. Uh, however, I think he's just going to sit back on the spell pierce, go for the transform next turn, and put the pressure on Dominic that way. Looks like the discard was a couple lands. Harvey just adds another mountain to the battlefield. Miriam will thought scour and step thing in the ice down to one counter. Lightning bolt opt flipped over. He'll draw off the thought scour. Yeah, Ross trying to figure out uh, if there's any reason not to uh, play that Thought Scour during the end step, tapping himself out. Something like uh, Through the Breach, uh, Primeval Titan, not super menacing because it just gets uh, two lands, but one of those lands could be the basic force, and that's uh, problematic. And Miriam will cast Manamorphose, transforms Thing in the Ice to Awoken Horror, and Harvey's he's had enough. He's going to pack it in. Ross Miriam 2-1 to one off the back of Blood Moon to take down Amulet Titan. Uh, and so he's going to advance to 10-1 and one with the Is It Phoenix deck. Really